Let me ask how it's being perceived globally. It's an interesting question. Um, I always find that books about communism are perceived in every, always as part of a general conversation about communism, if that sounds right. Um, and this one is no exception. Um, uh, you know, in the most interesting reception I've had so far is actually in Poland, where people know some of the story, but not very many details. And there was an overwhelming interest in it because, you know, you're our neighbor and, um, and we know, you know, you also suffered under communism and the Poles are very, they normally talk about themselves and their own, their own experiences and it was very interesting for them to hear someone else's. Um, in, the, in the Western world, um, I was expecting a much stronger reaction against the book. You know, I thought people would say, you know, this can't be true and, you know, you haven't proved it and so on. And actually, I really have had a very positive reaction. I think it's partly because um, first of all, I think the, the book is based on a lot of research that people recognize as real and is well done, mostly Ukrainian research done by Ukrainian historians. Um, I also think the fact that Ukraine is now a state with its own, you know, a president and its own army and it's defending itself and it's part of the world conversation and it has its own historians and its own archivists who are able to speak on in public. It, the history of Ukraine is perceived differently than it used to be. So instead of this kind of mythological country and we don't really know where it is and maybe this is true and maybe it isn't, people now have the sense that, ah, oh, this is a Ukrainian state and it has its own archives and this book is, comes from work done in those archives. And I, I, think it's, I, I think it's had a very positive reception, but part of the reception has been shaped by an understanding of contemporary Ukraine, which is better understood now than it used to be. Do you think there is a kind of a single or common narrative? I mean, people perceiving that there is Ukrainian history of the 20th century, from Holodomor to Russian aggression, and this kind of a, the same picture. So I didn't write the book for that reason. It wasn't my intention to show that the Holodomor is part of this longer chain of history. But yes, I think it does look that way. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I started the book before, I mean, I started the book in 2012 when Yanukovych was president. So it, the book wasn't intended to be part of Ukrainian politics. Or, But of course, when you write about, you know, Stalin in Ukraine and how Stalin perceived Ukraine as a threat, then pretty quickly you begin to understand, oh, uh, yes, and this is how Putin also sees Ukraine as a threat, as a kind of ideological threat. Um, and so it's hard not to see this this link to the past. What you said about Poland is very interesting because we have an impression that there is a kind of victimization of history in Poland. Yes. And there is a victimization of history in, yes. in Ukraine. Yes. And there are conflicting narratives. Yes. Do you think that there, there is an appreciation and understanding in Poland that Ukrainians suffered uh, a lot in 20th century? So I think there is. I mean, Poland right now is very deeply divided on, on right around exactly these issues. I mean, the histories of history are very much part of politics there. And there is a part of the country that wants to see Poland as a kind of eternal victim. And then there's a part of the country that wants to see Poland in a wider context, in a more nuanced way. It's also becoming clearer, I think, to more people that this conflict between Poland and Ukraine is also being manipulated. Um, you know, that it's in some people's interests to make the conflict, and I mean interest in Poland and Ukraine, but also in Russia, you know, to create this conflict, to build it up, to, to, to make it worse online, to manipulate in social media. Um, also, it looks like some of the, some of the kind of provocations on the ground, this, you know, graffiti and cemeteries and so on, it looks like some of that was Russian. It's about today's event and uh, events, and in this sense about unity, both in Europe and about transatlantic unity. I mean, what, what, uh, what is very difficult for us Ukrainians right now is this divide between yeah. US and Europe. And we see this clash going wider and wider on, on Iran primarily. We see Macron going to Kremlin. How do you perceive that? Look, we have the first US president since World War II who does not feel personally invested in or part of the transatlantic alliance. Um, who, and it's, it's more than, I mean, Obama was also much more oriented to Asia and so on than, than previous presidents. But this is a president who actually is hostile to the alliance. Um, and he's in the years before he became president in his books and so on, he said that many times. He doesn't like allies. He doesn't see why US troops are in Europe. He's, he's, written, in, he's written these things many times. And that, has, that is a big change. You know, we've never had that before. And so I would say it's mostly, 
this split is mostly to do with Trump and the way he sees the world. He also sees, he understands diplomacy as a kind of zero-sum game by which we win, if we win, you lose. Whereas historically, the transatlantic alliance has been, you know, together we cooperate and we both win. Well, um, and, we, and we create this trading system that's good for both of us, and we create this alliance that's good for both of us. Um, and Trump doesn't, he can't somehow see the world that way. Let's come back to Russia. I, can, I cannot avoid the question uh, of uh, Kremlin prisoners. You, we see the hashtag uh, behind Free Sense Off. It's kind of a wave in Ukraine. But it seems to me that uh, this issue is underestimated in the West. And the yeah, uh, World Cup is going to happen uh, like as if the nothing happens. How do you see it? Well, the World Cup is going to happen. You know, we had the Olympics in China and there were Chinese political prisoners. So it's not like this is unprecedented. Um, you know, I think it's a good moment for Ukrainians to talk about this, actually. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I don't know what will happen. I mean, it's possible the World Cup could be canceled for all kinds of reasons, I can still imagine. Um, but if it's not, this is a useful moment for um, Ukrainians to speak about it, for protests to be organized. Um, for the attention of international journalists to be drawn to this. I mean, I would, I would make use of it. I mean, it um, might be quite a useful moment for Ukraine. But generally, we feel in Ukraine that Russia comes from a strategy of direct, you know, invasion to a strategy of kind of a subversion of uh, putting chaos and destabilizing country from within. Do you have that feeling with regard to Europe, US, maybe? Yes, I mean, we now see this is not really a secret anymore. Um, Russia does not want to go to war with the West. I actually don't believe Russia wants to invade Estonia, you know, or even invade Ukraine much farther for the moment. Um, you know, it's very expensive to invade. People die. There's a backlash. You know, they don't want that. What they want to do is to um, is to undermine Europe um, from within. And they have a different strategy for each country. Um, in some countries, like in Italy, they have open relationships with the political parties. They have an open relationship with the Northern League, which is one of the um, well, now it's, I don't know who's running Italy right now. As we're filming this right now, Italy has no government, so it's hard to say. Um, but they have an open relationship with Marine Le Pen in France and, you know, and, and with the AFD in Germany, the, the um, alternative for Deutschland in Germany. And so they have some open relationships. They also have some clandestine relationships with business people. They have some corrupt relationships. Um, and in addition to that, they, um, they have a policy of... Um, uh, attacking and undermining um, journalists and particularly Russians abroad as a way of sending messages. You know, don't follow this person. Don't become a Russian opposition journalist. You know, don't work in Kiev. You know, don't defect to London. And this is their way of, this is partly about their own people rather than foreign policy. Um, but it's also partly a way of showing, look, we can do anything anywhere. We can kill anyone anywhere. We can do whatever we want. It's, it's supposed to make people frightened.